Hello, everyone. Wilfried, how are you today? I'm doing fine. Yeah, yes. feeling feeling any imposter syndrome being here today? It did happen, you know. I was like, um, really, yeah, it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, I'm really glad I'm here finally. Uh, no, I'm I'm so happy you're here too. But uh, I know that a lot of people when we do the lunch and learns. They tell me, I feel kind of imposter syndrome here again, and because who am I to be speaking here? But I'm really excited about what you have to share with with the community. So I'm glad that you're here too. Uh, thanks, thanks, <laughs> pleasure. So we have um, a few people have joined already. We have a long list of people who sign up, so we're gonna wait. I think um, two or three more minutes, uh, give a chance for more people to join, and then we're gonna start after that. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, Wilfried, where, where are you today? Uh, I'm in Burundi, Bujumbura. In Bujumbura, in the capital. Perfect. The capital, and, yes. By the way, just for everyone who's joining, you can uh, use the chat if you want to send any message. Maybe we do this every time, just share the country uh, where you are today. So those of you who are not, uh, you know, the two of us, you can't speak uh, because of the way that the webinars work, but you can post messages in the chat. So I see Elzo um, joining from Brazil. Um, I wanna hear where everyone else is today. I am in Barcelona in Spain. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, often people ask me, where are you? And you know, I spent uh, most of the time in, in San Francisco, California, the past like, I don't know, six, seven years, but um, we recently decided to move to back to Spain with, with my wife and the pandemic has changed so many plans for so many families, I guess. I know, I know. <laughs> how, so how is how is life in, in Bujumbura with, with COVID uh, this, uh, you know, these days, uh, Wilfried? Um, COVID uh, didn't really affect much uh, because um, once they closed down the, the borders, uh, people, there were no people coming in, mm -hmm. so people were not infected with uh, COVID. So the only people who have COVID are the people who are coming from outside, and then uh, they are confined until they are well before they right. are allowed in, into the country. So yeah, and yeah. All right, good to good to hear that. Yeah, but obviously the economy gets affected because of the things that comes from the outside. So like right now, it takes longer. Uh, like if you. They send something, so so the economy gets affected a little bit. It makes sense. Uh, we're going through this, all of us, one way or another. And it's a great example of how connected we are in the world, whether we want it or not, for good or for bad, but, you know, something that affects us in one place, um, sooner or later it gets to another, and, you know, we should be approaching this together, like many other things. But... Uh, we will talk more about this later. Uh, so I see people, you know, um, also Rose joining from Kenya. I have Amir from Bosnia and Herzegovina, people from Ukraine, Uzbekistan, South Africa, more people from Brazil, um, Estonia, Tunisia, uh, another person from South Africa. Hi, Ryan. Uh, more people from Brazil. Perfect. So um, before we start, we're going to start right away. Uh, I just wanted to remind you that um, we are happy to, you know, in your questions. Um, uh, if you want to know something about my careers, I can answer some questions, but I really hope that today we can make it about Wilfried and, and you know, his experience, not my careers. So any questions you have, do not put it in the chat because it's really hard to keep track of all the questions. Instead, there should be a button at the bottom that says Q and, and, and A. Uh, just click there and you can ask as many questions as you want. And you can see questions that other people have asked. So please, Put your questions uh, there. All right. So I'm still waiting for some people to join, but um, I think we just go ahead and, and start. So, um, yeah. Wilfried, I'll I'll just make a little introduction of, of you and this lunch and learn, and then we uh, I'm gonna let you do most of the talking. So, uh, first of all, you know this is a lunch and learn organized by by Microverse. We are a global school. We accept students from every corner in the world. We have students today learning full-time from 117 different countries around the world. And we teach software engineering and we help you get ready for remote and international opportunities so that no matter where you are today, you can get to like jobs 
uh, that give you experiences and salaries that are sometimes hard to find, you know, locally, but also so that you get experiences that are more, much more, you know, interesting and global, working with people from all around the world. And uh, today we have one of our graduates, uh, and so Wilfried uh, Chanirinka. Uh, he's joining us from, from Bujumbura in, in Burundi, uh, in East Africa. And uh, Wilfried like, uh, started the program in 2019 at the end, I think October, Wilfried? October, yes. October, October. cool. And you know, um, at the end of 2020, um, he uh, started his career um, after completing the program. So we're going to be talking about that career. Um, Wilfried today is the CTO, so the Chief, Tech, Chief Technical Officer of Atlas, uh, a creative agency uh, focused on web design, development, and branding in, in Burundi. We will be talking about that, uh, but something that I'm the most excited about you, Wilfred, is like your involvement uh, in the development and tech community. So today, I would love to be talking a lot about that, and uh, I hope you're ready. So, Wilfred, like, tell 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 us a little bit more about like you, like uh, who who are you, other than what what I just shared, which was just like a very superficial introduction. Okay. Yeah. My name, as uh, I said, he stated. My name is Wilfried Chaniringha uh, from Bujumbura, Burundi. It's, in a, it's a small country in East Africa. You can check it out on, on the map. Uh, yeah. Um, what he has, he has not said is that I also play basketball. I used to play for university, but uh, you like when you change the scenario. So I had, uh, now I play for fun. Uh, I also play piano. Um, I. I love music, yeah, obviously. Um, so I'm a software uh, engineer. Uh, I studied in Kenya. Um, I finished my high school in Kenya, then did my university in Kenya, worked a little bit in Kenya before I came back home and here in, back in Burundi. Um, I, yeah, I guess that's it, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome, and I like hearing about uh, you know basketball and piano because something I really admire and something we look for in the microwave community is uh, people who are eager learners, people who are always trying to learn new things, who are curious about life, and you know curiosity about software engineering is great. But the most curious people they are always looking for new stuff to learn, and, and I can recognize that in you, so that's really cool. <laughs> yeah. So, by the way, something I didn't say, uh, which to me has a lot of meaning, is that the story of Microverse as a school, as a company, in many ways starts in Burundi, right? And um, this is why I was so excited to, uh, when, when, when Wilfried joined Microverse, I remember thinking, wow, this is the first student that we have ever from Burundi. This is so exciting. And then the, the day that we like, uh, graduated, got the job, started working, I was like, oh, this is the first person from Burundi, Mike, like, who's going into the market? And yeah. uh, I'll just share the story quickly. But basically, I, I traveled to Burundi when I was, um, I, don't know, I was like 25 years old. So that was like eight years ago. And it was just in a transitional moment in my life where I decided to take one month of no work but because I'm a very curious person, as I was saying before, yeah. I just couldn't go to Burundi and just, you know, do tourism. By the way, I remember having a great time. I remember like uh, Lake Tanganyika and uh, the yeah. reserve with, with all the animals. So that was amazing. But I actually <laughs> spent one entire month in a town in the north of Burundi uh, teaching uh, in, in a computer science university. And that's where kind of, I, I found a lot of the inspiration to start my career. I've like, seen all these, like, you know, potential talent and seeing so much disconnection from the, 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 the world that I was seeing in San Francisco and in Europe. And that gave me the inspiration to like, want to, to do something about this. And uh, Wilfried, what, what, I, what I really want to hear about today from you is like, how are you helping your own country? Like, you know, uh, really um, like to surface all that talent because of the micros we're trying to do that globally, but uh, meeting people like you who are also doing that locally to me, has so much meaning and, and I can't wait to hear about it. So I'll be asking you a lot of questions about that. Okay, yeah. So uh, let's, uh, let's start with, um, you mentioned that you lived in Kenya, you studied in Kenya. So tell us about maybe, because today you are not in Kenya anymore. So how long were you in Kenya and why did you decide to return to Burundi? Uh, 
I lived in Kenya for 10 years, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, there I, I finished, that's where I finished my high school. Uh, then I did my university. I studied in a, a, a university called Africa Nazarene University. That's where I finished. Then uh, I started working for a company in Kenya uh, for a brief time. Uh, then I came back. The reason why I came back was um, Kenya is much developed than our country back home. And then I was like, uh, I'm really contributing to this already developed country. So I was like, uh, there's something I can do back home. So that's when I made a decision uh, to come back. I left uh, the job. Then I came back here uh, because I wanted to do something about it. I wanted to contribute to something about it to say that I did something, I contributed something for my country um, and to give back to my community. So that's what motivated me to come. And uh, to say also, to add on that, uh, I would say we used to come back for, for holidays uh, back home. And then most of the time we complain uh, the things, uh, you know, it, it was easy here. This thing, we had these things here, we had this, that, but we don't have this here. Then that's when it, it hit me. I was like, what can be done? Uh, is there a way it can be done? Then when people come back home, they don't complain, but they, they find that there, was also, there are also things that are happening back home. So that's, that's what also motivated me to come back. And then uh, I wanted also to be um, on the ground because when you're on the ground, you understand more on uh, the, the dynamics and what needs to be done and how, how it needs to be done. So that's what made me, that was motivated me really to come back home, yeah. And that's also awesome here, it's a very honorable, like, you know, purpose in life. I, I like hearing that. What, so you were talking about stuff that you didn't like, that you missed when you were coming back and realizing, oh, things are not as good as in Kenya, for example. But what is something that you love about Burundi and Bujumbura? I love um, the people, like the warmth. I think uh, you say that you, you, you happen to visit here. Everyone who has come here, you, you feel the warmth. And uh, yeah. there's, there's that way that makes people, when you come back here, when, when you come here, they make you feel home. They make you feel welcomed. It's not like, yeah. Um, and I love the people here. I love the, the culture and uh, the food, obviously the food. Mm -hmm. The food is, is, is really nice. Um, uh, and I love, I love the fact that most people know each other <laughs> because it's a small country. So if you don't know someone, someone your friend might know that person. So it's 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 good, and and it also helps in in terms of business. If you want to do a business, um, word of mouth here really works because someone, if you do something really good, they will tell somebody else. When they tell somebody else, you don't need to do marketing really yeah sounds like uh like the country version of a, of a tight community right like yes. people who are very close to each other and uh we know how amazing great communities are so um, i like hearing that great so um let's get into the software engineering world now how did you get into coding so you well you, you did computer science in in university right and yeah. was that your first kind of you know exposure to the coding world I would say yes, it was my first time, but uh, I loved computers before I encountered coding. Uh, I loved computers. I wanted to understand more about computers, but as I said, where we grew up, we didn't have those, uh, we didn't have uh, access to those uh, uh, computers or something like that. But uh, the moment I, I started university, uh, that's when, um, I fell in love with coding. Uh, I wanted to do coding. Then I got a job in something else different, <laughs> just as, a, as an analyst, as a support analyst uh, for that company where I worked uh, to, to help auditors to, to, to break down their audit process so that they, it goes paperless. So yeah, I was, I was in charge of um, the French speaking countries, and also, I was, uh, I would say, I was also doing the trainings for the French speaking countries, but also for the English speaking countries. 
because uh, the, the team was not that big. So everyone had his role. So uh, I would say that's where I first encountered. But when I did a shift in, the, in my job, I felt I was missing something. So when I came back home, that's when now the fire also rekindled. When I wanted to really know more about coding and getting into it, like get my hands dirty. Yeah. Uh, why, why did you decide that you needed to go back to like full-time learning to do that? Um, I, I, the reason I ask is that many people feel like, oh, you know, someone with a computer science degree uh, will know how to code. Why will they need to do more learning on, on top of that? Um, but the other version of that is true also. Like, you know, can someone without a computer science degree learn to code and get a job as a developer. So like, how, what did that look like for you? And uh, why did you go back to learning full time? Um, because I wanted, I had in mind to start a community. Then I cannot go to the community without the skills. So that's what made me, you know, like I need to get the skills so that when I go to talk to the community, it be, um, you are not dismissed. Like they know that you can do this. They know what you are talking about. It's, it's, it's what you do. It's, so that's what made me go back to learning full time to acquire those skills. So like when I go back to them, uh, there's that credit like, that is added. So they will listen more. Yeah. What, what were some of the skills that you thought you had to learn? New skills that you didn't learn in like, university? Uh, obviously uh, coding in general, because in university it's, it's a, it's a small piece, like if you, um, it don't gives you like enough baggage. Um, so I needed, I needed something like a place where I can, I can learn, like, uh, and that's like, not just learn, but also put into practice what I'm learning. So that's what Microverse was offering. So I was, that's when I decided to join Microverse because it was a perfect place because uh, at that time you are learning, but also like in a work setup in um, like environment. Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. Yeah, with the stand up meetings, with the coding challenges, with the peer programming, things like that. So it, it, it was a perfect, uh, what I was looking for, like, yeah. Makes sense. Uh, I can relate to that from my own, you know, personal experience at college. And, 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 and I saw the same thing, actually, when I was teaching in, in, in Ngozi, uh, that so much of our university like education is so like theoretical, and it's hard to really see the connection between all the theory and what you will be doing in the real world. Sometimes even what you are being taught, it's so old compared to what the market is using that uh, very often you need, you know, that foundation of college is great, but then on top of that, you need kind of like the more modern like skills and stack to just be able to you know get a job, uh, not just to know the engineering part. Um, yeah. So why 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 micros? Like you know how did you get to make the decision of joining micros? Um, I was I was at that time I was trying to get into Andela. I remember. Um, I had reached at the last uh, at the last stage where they call you for a week of bootcamp, two weeks for bootcamp. Uh, but during that period of time, uh, an announcement was made that uh, internationals that was I was that was in Rwanda, uh, Kigali, uh, but they say that they are no longer accepting um, international internationals. Yeah, so I was considered international because I'm not a resident of Rwanda. So that's when I, I decided, a friend of mine had told me about uh, Microverse. Then that's when I started looking into it. Then I saw it's really interesting and it's, it's well fed up for, uh, for my experience, uh, what I was really looking for. So that's when I, I, uh, I, I made a, a step to join. Uh, yeah, the process was quite really good to enter and uh, I, I think that I managed <laughs> to get into, into the program. You, you, you managed to get into and you managed to get out of that and you know uh, start your yeah. career uh, purely in software engineering so that's great. Uh, yeah. How do you remember your first week at my course? How was it? I was really tensed. Um, the, 
that uh, the how is it called the the, the syndrome um, the imposter syndrome kicked in the, the first week I was like am I good enough um, am I going to be able to make it uh, and it was also confusing like um, we didn't know where do we start uh, I remember because of the time difference. Uh, the first day, the first day, because of the time difference, I didn't know when the lunch was, which where to take the break, and I was still calculating, you know, and then uh, trying to match um, from the. I, I remember that time there was only one time zone, it was uh, UTC minus six, so I had to really calculate well where my my time zone will be like. So I remember the first day I even went on the break during the wrong time. <laughs> so my partner told me it was not break yet. So, <laughs> yeah. So you, so, so you joined, um, it, it was during a, a few months in 2019 that we decided to stop the Europe and Africa time zone. So you were going through the program at the other time, which meant you were finishing very late every day, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was finishing around 1, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. So, yeah. Wow. My, so my how, did, how did you get the support to go through such a, you know, intense experience at these weird times and doing it full yeah. time? Yeah. Uh, I remember that time. I also got a, a part-time job for, as a consultant uh, to consult uh, as a consultant in the IT infrastructure here in Burundi. It was a US-based company that was doing a research here. So it was only six hours a week. So I was able to manage. I was able to manage uh, six hours, six hours. It's, it's, yeah, so I was also getting, uh, they were also really paying really well. Uh, right. So I was able to manage to, to, to sponsor myself during, uh, through the, pre, uh, the period of uh, Microverse. That's, that, that's amazing. Like, um, I was going to ask you, how did you survive micros plus a part time job? But, you know, if it's like, we will always say, if it's like six to, like, you know, 10 hours a week, it's yeah. going to be intense, but uh, it's doable. But if you're doing yeah. like 20 hours a week in a, in a part time job plus micros, like, you're going to be burned out after a couple of months. So, uh, but, but I'm so glad you found that opportunity. And I guess for many people, even if they can get like a part time thing, it doesn't pay enough. But it's good that you were able to use your previous experience uh, to give you some like this kind of like you know high income uh, relatively to like to your expenses. So uh, good, yeah. good. Like something I I admire so much uh, in our community is that people are so eager to make this change happen. That wow, they'll they'll do whatever it takes to to go through it. And you know, it's uh, sometimes we have to like you know, kind of say, hey, you know, you're not committed, you know, full time, or you're like, you know, not meeting the goals. And it's so hard because we know how hard everyone is really trying. Um, so uh, and just, uh, I'm glad to, to hear that you were able to find the support without that, you know, distracting you too much from the experience. Yeah. yeah. Uh, right. yeah. So um, what, was, what was the most important thing that you think you learned at Microsoft? Teamwork. Okay. Yeah, I would say teamwork. Um, and also, I made friends, you know, like right. from different countries. Uh, I remember in my team, the, all of us were coming, were coming from different countries. I made friends in Brazil, Mexico, uh, Zimbabwe, Nigeria. It was really, really nice, like friendships that up to now we are still friends. That's the good thing that we're in the same team. We're still friends. I saw some some of the some of them here <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the webinar. So that's something I learned. Uh, teamwork was really fun. You know, it. I was also scared. Are we going to connect with my in the team? Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes when you get into uh, like people are, have different cultures, different languages, different approaches. Like you can say something. And uh, it might take a different thing because of the, the culture difference and stuff. But I really uh, enjoyed, you know, working with my team. And it, it was, it was a perfect team. Yeah, I would say so. <laughs> I love hearing that. And 
Uh, I, I don't know, Wilfried, if you joined uh, one of the last two student assemblies that we did. Uh, probably not, you have been working on so. But the last two assemblies, my topic of the, you know, the intercom talk was mm -hmm. about, you know, communication in these like multicultural environments. And mm -hmm. I've been, you know, repeating myself over and over and over and insisting people to read this book called The Culture Map. Uh, I'm going to put the name in the chat for people in case you want to look it up, The yeah. Culture Map. And it basically talks about how different you know, parts of the world, different countries, uh, you know, give feedback in a different way, make decisions in a different way, approach, you know, hierarchical relationships in a different way, deal with time in a different way. Oh, talking about time, I will never forget one of the things that uh, someone told me in Burundi was like, you in the West have the uh, watches. Watch. Here we have the time. And I was <laughs> yeah. like, oh my God, I'm so true. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, I I that remember so like days felt felt longer in in Ingozi. It was such a nice feeling. <laughs> yeah, uh, let's let's move. So great, 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 great to hear that you had a good experience with your team. It's one of the most important part for us, yeah. not just because we want you to have a great experience, but also because designing this like multicultural experience. It is probably one of the biggest part of the learning experience. Precisely because of what you said, right? Like you working with people who are very different to you can be challenging. It is challenging. Um, and it's the kind of thing that you only learn by doing it. And it's much better to learn that while you're learning at, at school, right? Than learning it once you join a, a company and a job where like, you know, they can fire you. You don't know how to deal with this situation. So yeah. What, what was the, the hardest thing for you about my course? Oh, the hardest first it was a time because the time difference Makes was really hard because um, the body had to adapt to that time shift so it really was first was the hardest thing um, and the, the second thing was um, the imposter syndrome <laughs> mm -hmm. I was asking myself uh, will I be able to finish because I've seen like some people don't finish because of maybe they get discouraged along the way so I was also like am I good enough to finish you know <laughs> or am I good enough to understand whatever is going to be given to us so really those two were the what was on my mind that was challenging were challenging so I had to overcome it yeah do you think there was any real foundation to think that you were not good enough or you think it was just that you know syndrome that you know it's natural to feel it but actually you were good enough um it's that you discover that you are good when you do it but before you do it you feel like it's you cannot do it but when you start doing it you realize Actually, I knew how to do it. Yeah. You know, like, that's what happened. You know, like it kicks in, but the, then, I, then you start thinking about it. And then you're like, you make a decision. Let me try. Let me give it a try. Let me see how it goes. Then the moment you give it a try, that's when you discover, oh, actually, I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that, that's why we insist so much on, you know, learning and micros to look as much as possible like a job. That way, if you know, and if we know that you can do it in my course, we know that you can do it in the job. So you won't feel like this like big, like two different worlds. It's just the same thing. And you can gain confidence before going to the job. That being said, a lot of people go to the job and imposter syndrome gets only more intense. But, uh, but then you start doing it at the job and you realize, oh, I can still do it. And, you know, I'm here. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. You, you decided to take a different approach than most of the people. They're not the only one, but instead of, you know, looking for a job and applying to, you know, companies and working for someone, you end up kind of starting your own like organization with a very specific purpose in mind where you're working as the, the CTO, the chief technological officer. Like, why was that? Uh, tell us about that, that process and why did you decide to go that way instead of like looking for a job for another company? Yeah, um, that's when now the community comes in. The community comes in. Uh, I remember back in uh, 2019, 
organized uh, the first hackathon here in Burundi, the first ever hackathon was in April. Um, that's, that's what like started this thing. You're like, uh, when we were organizing it, we were trying to reach out to people, organizations, and the government and stuff, but no one was, under, uh, was really getting what we are trying to do. They were like, oh, you guys are wasting time and stuff. But for us, there was, for, like for me, for, for example, for me, the passion was, I want them to see the talent, the local talent that is already here, but it's not being, um, but it's not being exploited. Like it's not being used. Um, so we managed to, to organize it with our own money. No one was willing to sponsor us, but we, because the passion was, we have, it has to happen. So we, we looked for funds here and there, family, friends. So we were able to, to, make, to make it happen. So now that's, uh, I, I think that's when uh, I joined after that, uh, after a few months that I joined Microverse, then we decided, hey, why can't we create something that can generate money that we can use now to organize these events? So now that's where the thoughts now start coming. Uh, the friends here, we talked, we, we looked into what can we do, in which uh, spectrum can we go into um, so that we can show uh, these people that, uh, that are saying that we cannot do it, that we can actually do it. So that's how it started. That's how now the company came in, came in the loop, uh, where we, we decided uh, instead of going knocking on doors, Let's make money and use this money to impact the community, to give back to the community, to organize these events uh, so that they can be part of something. And they, then, after, then from there, people can start, the government or anyone, any party that is interested can see that there's something that's happening. Uh, we can support them. Or, yeah, something like that. So that's how we, get, we got into Acris. Uh, that's how it was born with the community in mind, yeah. And that's amazing. I've seen that model working really well in a lot of countries where like you have this like really virtuous cycle of a company doing development um, to kind of, you know, use the local talent to give it, you know, more exposure, more career development, but at the same time developing, you know, community through events. And then the community helps the company attract even our position themselves locally to attract the best talent to get them even better work. And then it's like this like virtual cycle that makes like more talent, more community, more talent for the company, which you can do more community and, and it's just uh, it's just amazing. So it's very exciting to see that that you're starting with that with that model. Um, so yeah. what does the community, like the development community look like in, in, in Burundi today? Uh, right now it looks really good. Um, uh, last year, uh, we were able to interview, like, uh, no, it was in 2019, towards the end of the year, we were able to, to land a, an interview with Google uh, that is in charge of uh, developer communities. Um, in, in, in January last year, 2020, that's when they told us to organize a pilot uh, event to see so that they can see we can be, we are able to organize so we organized it it was successful then that's when also we got support from google now in the google developer group so it really helps because they give us resources they give us all of this documentation so that we can go through them and then share with them uh, with the community so now the community started expanding like because there are many topics uh, uh, we are getting and the, the support from uh, Google that is offering to the communities and uh, give them like in, in terms of maybe swags, those who are who love swags, um, they give us resources, those who love maybe like, let's say those who are doing cloud, they give us credits so that they can do those those labs for free. Uh, they give us, then we share them with the community so that those who, who want to go into cloud, they can have credit, they can practice, you know, with those credits. Yes, um, there's also that uh, uh, different uh, 
uh, resources that we get, maybe from Android, those who want to be Android developers, uh, Flutter, uh, those who, who, are, who want to develop uh, applications with Flutter, uh, and also there's WTM, Women Tech Makers, uh, which is also part of uh, what we are doing also to empower women, to empower women to, because we really lack here, like locally we really lack women in the, in the, tech, the tech sphere. So that's what also we are trying to do. So we also got that uh, done. Also development student clubs that we are creating in different university. We've managed to create two in different, uh, in two, in, in two, uni two universities. So we are looking creating more this year. So yeah, so those are the things that we are getting. Uh, the passion way it's, it's, it's going, it's, we are really trying to see that the community expands not only uh, those who are developers, but all that, uh, in the, that are really into tech, those, those who love tech, they can also have that chance, whether you, you did computer science, whether you did medicine or any, any other uh, uh, degree you did. So we, we welcome everyone. Everyone is, a, is welcome aboard. And then we can now see how the community can continue to grow and have all these different people, different uh, skills, yeah. That's amazing. Which kind of events are you doing? Um, like la last last month, last month we organized. Um, last month was March. Yes, we organized an event for for International Women Day, uh, organized by the WTM, uh, because it was a month for for women. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were able to organize that event for the uh, we were the organizers for the East Africa. So uh -huh. we're the ones who organized for the East Africa. So it was really, really fun. Yeah. That's amazing. So what was it like a, like a hackathon or like a meetup where some people presenting was, some topics? Out? Yeah, it was a meetup. It was a meetup where different women from different categories were presenting during that day. And then you could see the enthusiasm in, in the people uh, where now you can see how people are now embracing technology, especially women, because we need them especially in this, in this part, because many people are afraid. Uh, women are afraid of tech. I don't know why, but we're trying to see if we can maybe remove that fear and show them that there's a space for them also here. Unfortunately, yeah. we have done so much in the world to make women believe that tech is not for them in the past <laughs> you know, 100 years that uh, it's going to take a while to undo all that damage. But uh, I'm sure. glad to see that, that, that you are contributing to to change that. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm imagining these events were at the beginning in person and then with COVID were moved to the online world? Yes, uh, it had to be moved uh, because also Google gives us uh, precautions to take. Yeah. And they, they have to tell us this is how the events should be because if they sponsor the, the event, they need to know that you are observing the COVID-19 protocols. So we, it has to be online. Um, the, They've made it so much easier. They've created a platform. Uh, Google has created a platform for, for, for those kind of events so that it becomes easy for people to get into, get to see the rooms and stuff. And yeah, really good. Are you, are you looking forward to going back to the you know, offline world for those events? Really, yeah, we are really looking forward to it because uh, many people are really asking for it because there's that, type, that kind of interaction that they need. Uh, also. The reason being, uh, not so many people here have access to these tools. So when we organize in person, many people come for the events, but when it's online, the, the turnout is not that high because of uh, lack of tools to use. Um, Google can give us data bundles, but if they don't have where to put them, so they, they will not be able to use them. So, so that's also a challenge. Uh, because people love it, people want to be part of it, but when it's, it's organized online, it's a disadvantage on us, but we are doing what we can to help them. What is, what is the biggest limiting factor? Is it that, uh, you know, for people to join from home, is it computers, access to the internet, uh, stable power supply? Um, what, what, are the, what, what is the, the most uh, pressing one? The most pressing one is access to, to laptops. The laptops, makes sense, yeah. makes sense. Such, a, such an expensive investment. Uh, yeah, very expensive. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we are making effort and see how we can do about it. 
Um, so with that, we're also trying to see if we can create a more uh, nonprofit organization so that we are able to, there are people who are willing to sponsor those who are in the diaspora so that they can send those machines here, maybe, cool. yeah, then we can now distribute them in the, in the community, those who are really, who really need them, yeah. Well, so, let us know when you launch that, uh, see if, how we can help okay. there. I would love still, to. We are waiting to get approved, so it's still in the process. So that's what we are trying to do to see if we can, we can, we can attract those investors here or those in the diaspora who are willing to, to support us so that they, they, they can have a channel where they can do it really, really well, yeah. Well, cool. so you're working really hard to build community in Burundi. And I think in this past, I don't know, six, seven, eight years, we have seen a lot of organizations like Andela doing amazing things in Africa to really, you know, put Africa in, in the map and the world map um, as, a, as a source of, you know, amazing technical talent. Uh, what role do you see like Burundi and, and Africa playing in this like, you know, future of work where like we're more connected, uh, but still there are so many biases and so much hard work to do. How do, how do you see that transition? What do you think needs to happen? And where do you see Burundi in that, in that journey? Um, I can say that uh, in Burundi, what needs to be done is um, people to believe in the, in the local talent first. There is a lot of talent, not only here in Burundi, but in Africa, there are people who are really talented. Uh, and that is some talent that is untapped that maybe some big companies can look into, um, uh, even if it means outsourcing them because uh, it, will, it will boost the local economy, but also for the company because these, these are really talented individual and they will bring a new touch a new touch uh, that is different from you know like when you are in a, i realized when you are in a place you get to think like people there but when you when you come to a, a different place they will give you another perspective you never thought about so those are some of the things uh, i will say uh, i will also mention that uh, we need uh, like Burundi really needs maybe investors to come, uh, but also that depends on many, many, many things. But I see Africa really taking over in terms of uh, technology because I've seen uh, so many startups now uh, being bought by American startups, American companies, yeah. and they are really doing well. And if it's, it's really amazing to see young men and young women here in Africa that really doing stuff and it's being recognized uh, on the global map and it's really impressive. It's not that those talents were not there, it's just right now they have access to those uh, maybe uh, funds uh, whereby they can maybe uh, fund these startups so that mm -hmm. they can now see the really potential that is here. So Burundi, we are really doing our, our part. Uh, I know many other countries are also doing their part so we're also doing our part to see we can also go into the, we can also now put Burundi on the map uh, in terms of uh, skills, uh, yeah, and exposure, and maybe also attract more investors here because there's a potential to uh, for tech here in Burundi because it's still green, so meaning there's a lot of potential for for many investors. So yeah, and also it's well placed maybe in the East Africa. The, the, the way it's, it's way situated so it it can really complement uh, other countries around uh, if it develops in terms of technology and this also will impact uh, and bring uh, purchasing power which will enable local people to be able to get access to these uh, tools that are needed for technology to advance perfect we we definitely need to build that that uh, virtual cycle where uh, I am seeing a lot of uh, African startups now, as you said, being acquired by American startups. And then that means that the talent from Africa joins those companies. The companies get to see how amazing they are. And, you know, that inspires uh, other, you know, African, you know, entrepreneurs to start companies. And, and if it comes to this thing where like, at the beginning, you might feel like you're alone, you're an exception, uh, you're not making a difference. So, you know, it's just one 
grain of sand that may, creates two and two that creates four and you know exponential results can can be amazing uh it's um as you said it's, it's a it's a green uh, land in many ways which means there's so much opportunity and i'm excited to to find a way to continue helping more there so again if there is anything that we can do something that i always offer wilfried and you know i want to offer this to you right away but to anyone who is listening if anyone wants to enter for example y combinator uh, which is the one of the most the most important business accelerator uh in in silicon valley but because of covid now they allow you to like join internationally you don't have to go there to join uh we we went through it through my commerce and um, if anyone that you know um, wants to join Wild Community or wants to apply, please, or if anyone, you know, li listening today, they, they want to apply, please connect them with, with me and um, I can help them, you know, prepare their, their application and prepare for the interviews. Um, that's something that, that we do to, to help more entrepreneurs get connected so that we can, we can make a difference. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's <laughs> a good idea. We, I will, uh, if I find someone, I will, pro I will refer them to you. Perfect. So we, we have, I think, like 10 minutes more or less for, for some questions. Um, I, I forgot to repeat these. You know, if you have any questions uh, for, for Wilfried, please do not put it in the chat because it's hard to keep track of the messages. Put it in the Q&A section. There is a link at the bottom. I see we have some questions already, but if you want to add any other questions, please go ahead and, and do it right away. So um, I, uh, one person was asking, like, how was uh, the beginning of my course like did you do the pre-course work how did you get prepared uh to pass you know i guess the admissions process uh, okay uh i would say uh, at that time uh since i was also going through andela so i had also i've been a little bit doing some re uh, coding because it was like you have to show that you can code before you enter andela so at that time because i was transitioning it was kind of uh, because I already started earlier, so I didn't have to go through the pre-course. But I, before I did in, uh, the the three challenges, I I, I read about the pre-course. Then I saw something I, I'm able to do, so I went forward with it. Then I was lucky to get into the, the <laughs> program. Did you did you pass the three coding challenges on your first uh, attempt? No, not my first. I think it was my third try, try, try. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's not easy, but you have to keep pushing yourself. Yeah. And I, that that answers then the next question. The next question was: Is it possible to be admitted even if you do not do well in the coding challenges? So, uh, what do you think is the answer to that, Wilfred? Yeah, definitely because. It's not limited to any uh, to the number of tries you have to, to go through, as long as you, you know you, you need, you're willing to put in the work and do your research and find out, so you will be able to to do this uh, to do it. You you can try as many times as you need. Uh, something we always say internally and often externally is like that there is no such thing as failure, right? It is all only yeah. learning. So if we say you know if you can't pass a coding challenge still submit your your results because we will give you feedback on how to improve what to do to improve so that you can try again and if you fail again we'll give you more feedback so you can try again and again and again and again the same with the trials that come after the coding challenges the same during the program so like you know just keep going it is possible it's just a matter of, of determination yeah that's um, so true failure is not when when you you don't you don't manage to do it failure is when you stop the trying yeah. I couldn't agree more with that. Yeah, it's the moment you give up. That's when you fail. Yeah. Yeah. That's when you fail. Yeah. So the next question is, what kind of things should we do to be ready uh, to join Microverse? Uh, first, you have to make sure that you understand what you are going to into. Read well uh, and ask yourself what motivates you to enter because this will help you to finish the program. Yeah. Uh, for me, I had, I had where I wanted to go. So nothing, even when I didn't feel like doing it, I had to do it because I, I knew if I don't do it, I will not reach there. So find what, what really motivates you. Um, secondly, prepare, like you have to prepare like, uh, uh, 
mentally uh, that you're going to be maybe doing it for the, the next six months or eight months, depending on how fast you are, or nine months, 10 months, doesn't matter. So go on your, your own pace. Do not stress if you want to finish early, but know what is involved. And also if, uh, so that's, that really will really motivate you to, you know, to, to start knowing where you want to go. Right. Um, I, I want to add a couple of things more. Uh, that, that is great. I think mental motivation is an important one. The other one that I always tell people about is uh, financial support. Financial. Whatever you can do to save as much money as possible, to have a very open conversation with your family or whoever is around you so they understand what you're going to go through, get your environment, your setup in a place where you're going to be with no distractions, uh, make sure that you have maybe a backup internet connection. If your internet connection is not stable enough, whatever you can do. Um, and once you get admitted to the school, we will send you recommendations for, for all these things. And we have now a thing called the, the pre-enrollment bootcamp. And it's something that once you get admitted, but before you start, uh, we send you a lot of stuff for you to get ready mentally and technically uh, before your beginning of, of, of the classes. And um, I definitely recommend people completing this. But also, um, I wanted to give an update. Uh, Wilfred, you, you mentioned, you know, uh, go at your own pace, don't try to rush it. And someone was asking um, what happened to completing my career in six months. And I wanted to use this as an opportunity to uh, give an update uh, that Wilfred, I think you might not know about. So I'll, I'll, I'll share with yeah. you and everyone else. So May, uh, the next cohort, because we're not gonna have an April cohort, the next one will be in May, will be the first cohort that will be going entirely to what, through what we call MyCourse 2.0. And we have redesigned the entire program. It's been like six months of really intense work where the, almost the entire team in the company has been dedicated to this. And the new program has a, a fixed duration of seven months to complete the training, plus around three months for people to get a job. Uh, the new program, it's even more intense than the, the previous version of the program. But what we learned before is that when people had unlimited potential time to complete, it was much more likely for people to get distracted. And then they took unnecessarily long sometimes. That's why some people, instead of six months, some people took like 12, 13, 14 months to complete. And the longer it takes you to complete it, the more likely that something will happen, maybe to your finances, uh, your family, that will prevent you from you know, moving forward. So we actually redesigned the program to make sure that when you join, you know exactly when you will graduate so that you can plan really well for that. And uh, we're super excited. It's not only this, um, we're introducing a, a lot of new things like in, in the previous version of the program and the one you went through, Wilfred, we only had you know the solo projects and then the pair programming projects. Now you have solo projects, pair programming projects, projects with three people, with four people, with five people. Uh, you'll have like different like leadership roles within these uh, groups. You start doing like project management, start practicing agile methodologies. And uh, these are just some of the things that we are launching with this new uh, improved version. And we are so, so, so excited about it. Wow, that's a new one. Those are <laughs> really new changes. Yeah. So I think that's really good. Yeah, it will really maybe motivate. Uh, yeah, I've seen like, if you stay longer into the program, you realize that uh, you, lose, you start losing interest. But when you know like exactly when you're going to finish, I think it's going to motivate more people. Yeah, we, we think so. And we, we have redesigned the entire thing without compromising on any of the, on the learning goals. In fact, we doubled down. We looked at the data from every single student who, who graduated, who got a job. And we looked at, okay, what it took them to get a job. And we use all that data and all the market data to redesign the entire program. And it's like, it's like uh, oh, I'm, I'm so excited. I, I can't wait. Uh, we have been testing uh, parts of the new program for a few months now, and it's working so well. But the main cohort will be the first one that goes completely through, through this new program. So very, very excited about that. Um, and there's a very interesting question here, um, Wilfred, because it's connected to, to the, I think, to the idea of imposter syndrome. And I want to hear your, your, what you think about this. So uh, someone was asking, I have been taking coding courses in like Udemy, for example, but I still feel like I'm not yet ready to join my course. Does it really matter how ready you are before joining? Um, I would say if you 
waiting to be ready, you will never be ready for, to join. First, try, it will be, you'll be able to understand where your weakness is. Like, why did you to be able to achieve it? Then you can go back to the drawing board and see where do I need to put much effort? So this, this will help you now to, to, to keep assessing. This is what will also happen during the entire process of microverse, whereby when you miss something, you go back and see where, what did I miss? Uh, what should I do to, to, to get better? So I think don't, uh, don't wait until you, you are ready because you might never get ready because all, all of us, when we start doing something, we don't know if we are going to, to finish it, but we just start. And if it fails, we always go back and see what should be, should we do better? Yeah. And, and imposter syndrome, thanks for the answer, but uh, imposter syndrome, it's so uh, common. And so yeah. often you doubt yourself and you are your worst enemy. We all do this to ourselves, but we have designed the coding challenges, the trials in the admissions process, and also all the capstone projects. And now, by the way, with Microverse 2.0, we have a lot of quizzes and we have smaller projects that you do every day. And we have designed all these things so that you can constantly know, are you ready to move forward? Are you ready to move forward? And if you're not, it's not like you failed, what we were saying before. No, just you know, go back to learning and you try again until you can pass those coding challenges, the trials, the capstone project. So, do not let yourself be your worst enemy. Let us do our job. Our job is like to teach you and also to test you that if you're ready, let us tell you if you're ready or not. Don't try to guess it because more often than not, uh, you'll be stopping yourself unnecessarily. And you know, that, that's not good for anyone. Um, yeah. so someone, by the way, was asking about um, like a follow-up question of, about Microis 2.0. And I think it's a good question. It's like, so uh, with this six, uh, six months uh, of Microsoft, it's seven months, not six, by the way, is it possible to apply for a job before finishing the entire program? Okay, so this is a really good one. Uh, Wilfred, did you apply to a job while you, were, while you were in the program? Yes, I did. What happened? I did. Um, you get interviews, uh, you do them, but uh, it doesn't stop you from, from accepting a, a job offer because there are many, um, many of our colleagues that left the program early before they finished the program because they got a job uh, beforehand. So you don't really need to finish the entire program. Maybe you are at a certain point in the program and then you get a job, you, you take it. Yeah. And we, we always say that our goal is to help you get your first job and then your second, and then your third, we'll continue you know, helping you. But the first important milestone is for you to get that first job. So yeah. whether that happens in the middle of the program or at the end, uh, it doesn't matter because we, we managed to accomplish that goal together. But uh, with Microverse 2.0, it, it's so much more intense than before because it has like daily and weekly deadlines that people that start applying to jobs because applying to jobs is like it's a numbers game so more often than not they don't even reply to you uh something to reply you go to an interview and they say no or worse they send you a take-home assignment that takes like two days to complete it and then they say no to you so you end up getting distracted from the program and then you miss deadlines and then you have to repeat parts of the program you lose your motivation and then you start doubting yourself even more so what we recommend to people is like you know this is one of the reasons why we wanted to make the program like more deterministic in length. Go through the program. It's going to be seven months. Do not try to look for jobs so that when you finish, you're completely ready and we'll assist you so that you go all in, you maximize all your options and we can help you deal with your motivation. Now, if you happen to get a job offer while you're in the program, you can definitely let us know and a career coach uh, from my career will help you know how to approach the negotiation process and, and all of that. But in general, especially with my career 2.0, it is impossible to actually meet the deadlines, the weekly deadlines and, and milestones while at the same time applying for jobs. So just, you know, be, be mindful about this because uh, it's, it's changing a lot. So um, this is just one last question. Maybe we can, I, I can answer this quickly and then we can, we can uh, say goodbye. Um, someone was asking about the, the average income of my career's alumni two years after completing the program. Uh, we have been, as a school, uh, operating for just basically two years. So it is too soon to have 
uh, statistic significance uh, of you know, what happens after two years. But what we are seeing is that after a year, we are seeing salary increases of around 40% after just one year after your first job at Microsoft. So, and that combined with the average salary increase, so if you compare your job before Microsoft and after, the average salary increase is around a 300%. So you almost triple your previous salary. So if you compare that plus an increase in 40% after a year or so, like it doesn't matter what your previous job was and how much money you were making, relatively speaking, the increases will be huge. So um, it, it, I always talk about how salaries don't mean a lot unless you know how much you need to live and you know different countries are, some are more expensive than others. Uh, what matters is like the relative impact compared to your previous salary compared to like local salaries. And, and in that sense, you know, uh, people are doing really well. So um, before we say goodbye, uh, Wilfred, any piece of advice that you want to give to someone who is considering, you know, setting a career in software engineering and, and joining Micros? Yeah. Uh, what I can say, uh, don't doubt yourself. Uh, don't keep, don't think you, you want to be ready for you to start. You just start and then let experience teach you like along the way, make mistakes. Don't be afraid to make mistakes, make mistakes. We all do make mistakes. Uh, and then from mistakes we learn. So don't be scared of doing, of starting something, whether it's a community uh, and also always want to give back because um, what we get it's for us to, to give it back, to share it. So it's not for our, it's not for us, but it's also for everyone else out there who is willing to listen. So be the voice you can. And, uh, yeah, and get motivated and find your passion first. Find your passion and find what, what will push you for you to achieve your goal and don't procrastinate. <laughs> That's an amazing. Uh, uh, I think like our job number one at Microsoft is to make sure that you do not procrastinate because it's so easy to end up doing that. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So, uh, Wilfred, um, is it okay for people to like con like follow you on Twitter? I was gonna share. Yes. Perfect. Yes. So I'll, I'll share your like your profile here on the chat. Uh, you yeah. can follow like Wilfred um, on okay. on Twitter. You can ask him questions there. Wilfred, again, yeah. thank you so much for being here today. Thank yeah. you for all the hard work for wanting to give back to the community. Let us know on Twitter, reach out to me directly if we can help also, you know, uh, with, yes. with those, with that massive challenge. And I'm really excited to like keep following your journey in this, in this amazing career.